right, it's a real honor to have Jeff Patton here. Uh, just to give a little bit of introduction about Jeff Patton, I'm sure most of you have heard about Jeff Patton, saw him last night on stage. Uh, Jeff has been one of my gurus. He's been uh, a very big influencer for me. Uh, in fact, the most embarrassing moment for me was in 2007, sharing a stage with him while receiving the PASC award. I keep haunting him for that. But uh, Jeff uh, is a wonderful guy, and I'm sure you'll enjoy his keynotes. So over to you, Jeff. Thank you so much. If you ever hear me say this, uh, if you ever hear any consultant say this, uh, first off, you know not to believe them. Uh, and the, the older I get, the longer I do this, the more I realize, well, the more I realize the sheer volume of what I don't know. This is a talk about, gosh, it's not squarely about Agile. I'm not going to talk about Agile. I'm not going to talk about Scrum. I'm not going to talk about any of this stuff. I'm going to talk about software development and how, well, I'll start with how I've been fooling myself from the very beginning, from the very outset of my career in software development. I, uh, I, I fool myself as a profession. And I want to talk about how I broke myself of the habit. And then over the past, especially over the past 10 years, how I'm seeing organizations start to break themselves of the habit. Uh, look, we spend a lot of time fooling ourselves. We spend a lot of time pretending like we were successful. And for as much as we use expressions like fail fast, and part of the reason we're iterating is to, is to learn, look, no one wants to fail, no one wants to be wrong. This is one of our biggest problems to fight, or one of the biggest cultural issues I've got to fight. There's a video over there that's worth looking up, especially if you've got kids. Make your kids watch it, uh, watch it as a parent. But this uh, Derek Sivers video, the why you need to fail. All right, let's tear in. I need to talk about me. And I want to rewind all the way back to, oh, would have been um, about uh, early 90s and my first job in software development. And I remember how being given the job, I, I, I wrote a piece of software for online aircraft parts ordering. Uh, this is for uh, people who fix aircraft to be able to go online and place orders. And this is in the early 90s when uh, they would have done this normally through call centers, and doing this online would have been kind of a big deal. And I remember building a piece of software I was really proud of. And well, I remember thinking the code was super good, and I wasn't going to have any trouble with that. And I remember telling this guy, this is my friend Bill, that the, the now I've known for, God, how long have I known Bill? This is the early 90s, uh, 25 years, something like that. Bill was in charge of uh, testing, in charge of QA at the company I worked for. And I could remember Bill saying, look, Jeff, I need to get your code. We need to get your code. We need to start testing this code uh, because you've got to go live with this stuff. And I said, Bill, this code is so good, you're not going to find any trouble with it. Uh, so I'll get it to you when I get it to you. Uh, uh, look, uh, I got Bill. The code a, a week before delivery, so that should have been plenty of time. Uh, but Bill, in just a few minutes, starts breaking it, starts finding lots of breaks. Uh, and that's, well, that's my first instance of really realizing, my god, I can't believe that I, I believe my code was so good. I had thoroughly fooled myself. It's over the course of the last 20 plus years, I've realized uh, it takes a different kind of head. It takes a different kind of thinking to really look at and break software well, and that testing is a strong profession. Uh, this is a photograph from a recent team that I'm working with, and we pulled this very small team together for a workshop, and this is a very small cross-functional team, and sitting next to each other are tester and developer. These people are working extremely tightly together. They're working so fast that they don't have time to move tasks around on a board. In fact, uh, the sticky notes sticking on the back of their computers show what they're working on right now. And when the developer on the right is done with something, he will take the sticky from the back of his computer and move it uh, to the person who's testing on, on her computer. And she's testing things, and he can lean over and look and see what she's doing. And she'll say, look at this. Uh, this is a lot faster than logging bugs. And what I see is this rhythm of these people having a conversation about the code. 
and it's no longer about logging bugs. It's about her looking at the code from a different perspective and making his code better. And I've seen over the course of years developers learn how to build a strong partnership with test. So look, my lesson learned that testing, testing well is a critical discipline. It's a skill that you can work a lifetime to be good at. My friend Bill is still in charge of testing, at the, uh, in charge of QA at the company I was at uh, in, in 91. And he's, it's a lot bigger company now, and it's great. But uh, look, it takes complementary skills uh, to build software. It isn't just one good developer. But look, one of the things I could fall back on when I started in, in my job was I'm a, I'm a white hot UI designer. I can design really great UI. And it's because I'm an art school dropout. Now, look, if you're an art school dropout and you become a software developer, uh, basically the UI design that I designed sucked less than every other software developers. Uh, so uh, as a front end, as a front end developer, I was the man. I was great. Everybody said, wow, you've got to uh, put your magic on this UI. It's going to be really fabulous. And I managed to fool myself into believing it really was fabulous. And everybody loved it, uh, at least until we shipped. Uh, this is when I learned another really hard lesson. Now, first off, has anybody here in the room ever sat with a customer or user as they've used a product you've built or you've worked on before? I see some hands. Now, if you think back, that's a, that's a lot of people, that's great. Uh, if you think back to the very first time you did that, how did that go? Not, so I'm hearing some uh, words, and what I listen for is kind of the nervous uh, angst build up. Did anybody have a great time doing that the first time? Anybody? See, a, a couple. Look, uh, I found that almost all the time, especially when I started, that it never went the way I expected. Uh, the users didn't love this stuff uh, as much as we loved it, as much as I loved it, and uh, we were just wrong. Uh, you, know, you come out of that experience with one of two reactions. You'll either say, those stupid users, they don't know what they want. Uh, uh, or, I can do something about this. I can make this better. Uh, I learned very early on that UI design isn't about making things look good. There's a simple model that I draw on napkins a lot. So this is the model drawn on a napkin. But uh, let me explain this really quick. If I'm, I think of UI or user experience as having these three different layers. If I'm building software uh, for someone and I find a problem, something that's difficult for them to do, it's a challenge, and I identify a feature that will make things better, make it easier for them to do things, uh, that's this raw utility layer, a feature that helps me, helps a user accomplish something they couldn't before. That's giving them raw utility, and that's going to make them happy. Well, the next layer above that I'm going to refer to as usability. That's how easy it is to learn, how quick it is to use, how efficient it is to use, how well we remember, remember it the next time we go to use it. And if I can ratchet up the usability, that makes things better. And this last thing, now that's actually the aesthetics. That's the way it looks. That's the, how consistent it is with my brand. And because the way something looks uh, inspires confidence, things that look good actually are easier to use and learn. Uh, there's an old expression, uh, you can't judge a book by its cover. That's an expression because people judge books by their covers. And uh, well, people will judge the inside of your product, or they'll judge the quality of the inside of the product based upon what they see on the outside. So uh, this isn't just isn't just a simple thing. Making things look good turns out to be pretty important. And now, if I look at this raw utility thing, look, this is a, an example of a website in the US called Craigslist. Is there an equivalent in India to this? Yeah. So it's, a, it's a pretty bland, pretty boring website. And it's an example of squarely hitting utility. Not beautiful to look at, and by all accounts, not horribly easy to use, but simple enough. Uh, but that squarely hits this usability thing. Now, uh, every once in a while, I'll find it's hard to find products that get the usability and the aesthetics, but don't get the utility right. B 
because they hit the market and they die. If it doesn't solve a problem, how does that product survive? Anybody think of a product that, that, that doesn't have real utility? Uh, Microsoft Bob, well, it died. <laughs> uh, look, the, the poster child for products that don't have much utility is, is, is that, uh, the Segway. Look, that's a product that's been on the market for a long time. Nobody quite knows what to do with it. If I came up to you and said, look, I've got this idea for a thing that allows you to uh, move around without walking, not very fast, and you can't carry stuff, and you'll look really stupid doing it, and it only costs about the equivalent of three or $4,000 US. Would you jump right on that and say, well, that sounds terrific. Um, they've been struggling and uh, looking for uses for this. The product won't go away because there's, there's enough uh, investment behind it. Um, about the only use uh, we start to see are, uh, well, mall cops and uh, things like that. Look, those guys don't look scary to me. Uh, they, they make me want to steal something um, because they couldn't catch me, not in those things. Uh, uh, now, the last part, and the, the part that we often look at with UI is this aesthetics part. And oftentimes you pull in UI people late just to, to make it look good. Uh, because we're not thinking about this raw utility stuff at the bottom. Now, let's, uh, people know the expression for just making it look pretty, or uh, the, uh, the expression lipsticking the pig is the common expression for that. So look, I learned very on that a lot of the UI work that I was doing was lipsticking the pig. We were making bad choices about what to build, and that was the real problem. It was getting that utility stuff right. So look, uh, we decided, look, I, we need better requirements. And if I'm going to get better at this stuff, if I'm going to be, get better building software, uh, we, we need to, well, users need to be better at telling us what they want. Well, let's. Anybody who's ever been in a talk I've given, I redraw this same model over and over. And I think I'll keep beating this uh, model and, until the, the language is pretty common. In software development, you aren't here to build software. And that's one of our biggest false assumptions is uh, where we're good at this stuff when we can build a lot of software fast. In fact, that's not the reason you're doing this. You're in software development to change the world. Now. Uh, Hold on a second. Good. All right. Uh, for people who will be in a workshop I'll, I'll teach later this week on uh, Sunday and Monday, I do a lot of hand drawing. And uh, it's, my slides have gone so out of date, it takes me a while to do it. So look, this is just the hand drawing of this. If your job is to change the world, and actually, I'm still not getting it all. Look, in a keynote talk, Never change your slides while you're doing it. <laughs> also fooling myself right now that I was ready. <laughs> All right. This is what I wanted. Look, the, this model starts like this. You start by looking at the world as it is now. And in particular, you start by looking at the people that use your product, or the people you wish to use your product, or just people that you think you can help with a product, and you'll find people that are unhappy or frustrated or mad or confused. And it's looking at these people and the way that they work that, that gives you ideas. Now, those ideas could be for whole new products. They could be for features. They could be for enhancements. And how many people have heard me give this same uh, spiel before? Anybody heard this before? I'm glad this was news to a few, or this, at least this discussion or this framing is uh, new to a few people. Look, it's all these things that we eventually start referring to as our requirements. Now, I'm going to come back to this word, uh, because if we need better requirements, one of the challenges here, we, well, one of the things we have to remember is the requirements are just another word for our great ideas we believe will solve people's problems. Now, it doesn't matter what process we use, whether it's an agile process or a waterfall process, we go through some process, and in the end, we build something. Something comes out and it comes out into the future world. And what we hope is true is that those people that we looked at before, they, they get this product and they're happy. And because people are different, some people are less happy, and some people there's no pleasing. Now, it's everything between that idea and the delivery that we fixate on a lot. Uh, uh, that's the stuff, well, that's the output of this process. We know we're talking about output when we fret about time and schedule. 
And when we're in an agile process, we know we're talking about output when we talk about velocity and we fixate on how fast we're building things and increasing our velocity or having a stable velocity. But uh, oddly, that's not what matters. What matters is what happens when things come out. And the term I want to use for that, well, it's aptly named. It's outcome because it's what happens when things come out. And we measure outcome, well, not in terms of how many features we ship. If you think of a product that you really love, some product you would tell somebody about, and uh, think about what you would tell them about this product you like, I'm pretty confident that you won't tell them, I love it because it was on time. What we're looking for is what that product allows you to do differently than you did before. Or the way we measure outcome is in changes in behavior. Behavior like buying, uh, adopting, and using your product. If you build a product that helps, uh, well, has a specific set utility, lets people do something, do they actually use it? When we're talking about requirements, oftentimes we use the term capability too. But look, if we build a bunch of capability twos and ship them, and no one actually does any of that stuff, that doesn't matter. I'm not interested in capability twos, we're interested in actually do's. And we measure outcome in terms of, well, how do they actually do those things? We get benefit when, or they get benefit when they actually use the software to do what they're doing. Now, when I draw the model before, it looks like it's all about people, but the model actually starts backstream, or all the way up. It starts with our business, and it starts by us looking inside of our organization. It starts with us uh, asking, well, where do we want to be as an organization? What is our strategy? And, well, maybe things aren't so good here. We need to improve. And that should cause us to focus on specific customers and users. And look, one user may buy a product and use a product, and that's interesting, but if hundreds do, thousands do, hundreds of thousands do, that becomes really, really interesting. And it's the consequence of all that behavior change that really uh, creates impact. Those are the three words I want people to understand. It's, uh, we fixate a lot on output, but it's the outcome and impact that we're really shooting for. And in fact, your job is not to build a lot more stuff faster. We've got this big assumption that everything we build will generate outcome and impact. And in fact, it does, but well, not always positive. In fact, one of the big problems with software development is there are always a lot more ideas than we ever have time and money to build. Your job in software development is to build less. It's to minimize that output. At the same time, we're maximizing that outcome and impact. I want to go back to this word requirement for a minute. Uh, well, I worked uh, with an organization in the early 90s, that organization where Bill worked for, and I built software primarily for retailers, and over time, mostly brick and mortar retailers, large chain stores, uh, organizations that had at least 100 stores and into, the, into the thousands. And I had lots of customers telling me they wanted lots of things, and I learned very early on as a product manager for the organization that if I did what any one customer said, others would be unhappy. I learned that those customers didn't have my business's interest at heart, and I, well, we were just, we didn't have requirements so much as we were making decisions, the best decisions we could about what to build. As our company grew, um, I started there, there were 30 or so people as we grew to a few hundred people, and we opened up a, a development office in India, and uh, we were uh, growing stronger, we got more traditional software people in. And I can remember a lady coming to me one day saying, uh, Jeff, there are some things we need you to add to the product you're responsible for. And I said, great, no problem. Tell me a little bit about uh, what the features are and, and who they're for and, and how they help. And uh, she looked at me and said, well, they're requirements. And I said, I, I get it. Uh, Tell me what customers really need them and, and who's using them and, and how this helps them. And she looked at me like I was stupid and said their requirements. That's when I learned that this word means shut up. Um, the, uh, talking about just the idea, just the feature, just the details, uh, uh, it, it turns out is a problem. It's, it doesn't afford us the opportunity to step back and minimize output, to step back and really understand the problems we're solving. And look, 
uh, this is a guy named Kent Beck. At my earliest Agile project, Kent was the coach that was hired uh, to help our company adopt extreme programming. Now, he first described this idea of stories in this book called Extreme Programming Explained. Now, I mentioned yesterday in answering the question uh, about stories and user stories somebody had asked, that yeah, Kent originally called them stories and not user stories. And in defining what a story was, he said, look, software development has been steered wrong by the word requirement, defined in the dictionary as something mandatory or obligatory. The word carries a connotation of absolutism and permanence, inhibitors to embracing change. And the word requirement is just plain wrong. What Kent was, well, the behavior change that we were looking for with stories and with agile development is, well, they're called stories because of the way we use them. We're supposed to be talking with each other. And as a reminder for what to talk about, this common template emerged for writing stories. This as a, a particular user, I, I want this feature, this idea, this thing, this capability, so that I, I can turn that frown upside down, so that I get this benefit. It's a simple forcing mechanism. It's a conversation starter, so that we start the conversation by talking about, well, what we're building and why. Now, over, you may know this about requirements, and I learned this early on, that you can deliver a fraction of what's required and uh, people will be thrilled. You can deliver all of what's required and people will be unhappy. And I learned, well, here's a simple table to kind of frame this, uh, frame this, that, look, if I'm focused on on time, uh, getting things done on time and a positive outcome, look, if I get everything they ask for done on time and the outcome is good, people use it and people are happy, look, I'm great. If, if I'm not on time and the outcome is bad, well, I suck. And I think we've all seen that. Uh, but there's the other weird things where if it's not on time but the outcome is good, I still am good. I, I could be golden and, and still be late. Um, and even weirder, if I'm on time and deliver everything they asked for and the outcome is bad, well, I suck, but they just won't tell me to my face. Uh, they're, they're, they just won't hire me again. So look, my lesson learned early on is that it does not matter what the requirements are. If in the end, if the outcome is bad, I lose, and look, I need to be better at focusing on that outcome. That's what, we're, what we should be doing with uh, agile kind of thinking. Now, uh, the, for me then in my growth, I said, look, uh, if I'm gonna better understand users and what they're doing, I, I need better research. And uh, well, one of the pitfalls that I fell in was to try and get data. And I learned very early on that it, it isn't data so much that matters. Now, I'm going to frame this with not my stories, but other people's stories. This is a very old picture. This is a guy that I, you can tell it's an old picture by, that's what, for the younger kids, that's what monitors used to look like, uh, if you remember. <laughs> that was a big one. It was really good. Um, uh, these people are pair programming. This is my friend Andrew and uh, Silage, uh, uh, the, the, I work closely with. They're on my team. For people that are, uh, this picture is a 2001 picture for people that are, look, that's one of the very first story maps that I built on the wall back there. It's just a line of cards that tells a story, nothing, nothing to it. But look, uh, this is us, this is our team room in 2001, and uh, my friend, I've, I've left this company long since, and, uh, but I still know them, still work with them a little bit, and we built software for large brick and mortar retailers. Now, one of our customers in the U.S. is a company called L.L. Bean. I don't know if people have heard of L.L. Bean as a clothing manufacturer before, and they kind of manufacture nice premium clothing. We built software that they use in their brick-and-mortar retail stores and some of the stuff that backends what they're doing in the back. But, but L.L. Bean builds really good products. And in fact, posted on the wall there is a message from the founder that, look, I don't consider a sale complete until goods are worn out and the customer is satisfied. Now, working with L.L. Bean, we had gotten this complaint that our, the return part of our software was difficult. It was challenging to use, and it took a while. 
and we went through the data. We found that, well, the number of returns they do is a fraction of the number of sales, so it's not very big, and the time it takes to process a return, well, it's only just a little bit more than the time it takes to process a sale, because we've got to gather extra information. And using data, we uh, told LL Bean that this really isn't that big of a problem, and we're not going to prioritize it very high to make this change with respect to other things. Now, they complained a little bit loudly, and they're a uh, concern of ours. So this is where I learned very early on that I had a good CEO. We get in airplanes, and we fly to where they work. This is where L.L. Bean processes returns. And the, look, it's, it's during business hours that this place is really, really crowded. And what we learned is that L.L. Bean does not do returns in, at the regular checkout line with everybody else. They do returns all in one place. Uh, they want to talk to you. They want to hear what's going on. They want to uh, talk about the thing you're returning. And when we look in the back room, these are bins full of things that they've tagged and bagged, things that they returned. And there's a, a lot of them. Uh, with these big L.L. Bean stores, there's a ton. So uh, uh, what's interesting is that's Still, that's Eric, my CEO, and it's nice when the CEO sets an example by going out and he's the one that talks directly to the customers, and we're there too. The, the lesson learned for us is that, the, look, returns from the data may not seem like such a big deal, but when you're standing out there with them, working with them, and seeing these people that do nothing but returns all day long, little annoying things in the software pile up, and it really sucks. It's out of being there and seeing uh, seeing them work, that we build empathy for the way they work. So the lesson for me very early on is you don't get empathy from data. If you're a product owner, I promise you, you will prioritize a backlog different if you've looked the person who has the problem in the face. And uh, that's going to change things. Now, there's, lean is a term that gets used a lot, and out of lean thinking comes a lot of basic principles. And one of the terms that gets used by lean thinkers is, is gemba. And in Japanese, that translates loosely to the scene of the crime or where the work happens. And gemba, when we're talking about figuring out process problems, is where developers work and where the teams work or where your workers are doing their jobs. But when we're talking about products, gemba is where they work. Now, very early on, I remember in agile development, the idea was we want to get those customers as close to us as possible. But let me talk about why that doesn't work so well. Look, uh, this is Jane Goodall. And I need you all to imagine your Jane Goodall for a minute. Now, if people who don't know, Jane Goodall is uh, famous for studying primates, in particular uh, apes chim and chimpanzees, uh, things like that. And look, uh, someone who is an agile person might say, look, Jane, this is horribly ineffective. You get on airplanes, you, you go out to Africa, you spend weeks out there, you gather notes in, in bad conditions, and we've got an agile approach that will really speed things up for you. It's called chimpanzee on site. And we'll bring the chimpanzees to you. And then if you have questions about their behavior, you can just turn and ask them. And uh, things will go so much faster for you. Uh, you'll be horribly efficient. Now, uh, first off, you probably know that uh, the, if you're going to really understand chimpanzees, that's not a good way to do it. Uh, and if you're going to really understand people you're building software for, it turns out that's not a good way to do it either. I look for excuses to use that old Woody Allen quote that 90% of life is just showing up. And when it comes to the way we work with our customers and users, it's just showing up. When I look back through pictures I've got, I've got lots of old pictures of watching people work in back offices, in, a, 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 in boring surroundings. Um, this, guy is a, this guy is a stock portfolio manager, and working for this company, work this fairly large company that everybody would know the name if I said it, and I should, 
I'm not going to say it. But uh, look, working with this company, we're building this portfolio management system. We're talking with folks, and they say, OK, these are our requirements. And they say, look, we just want to get a feel for how the portfolio managers work. Uh, can we talk to them? And they said, ah, they're very busy people. They make an awful lot of money. We can, uh, uh, you know, they're responsible for a lot of our revenue. We can uh, let you talk to them, but we can set up an appointment maybe a week or two from now. And uh, uh, yeah, well, OK. Uh, uh, where, where do they work? Could we just go down to where they're working and see where they work? And they said, well, they're down on the third floor, but you know, it's a very secure environment, and, uh, and no, you, you can't go down there because you disturb them. And I said, well, we just want to go down and take a few pictures so that we can understand how, what their work surroundings are like and other tools they use. And they said, well, you definitely can't do that uh, because it's a lot of legal ramifications and things like that, so no, you, you definitely can't. And we said, uh, well, oh, OK. They left, we went over to the elevator, we hit the third floor, we went down to the third floor, we stand and we watch from behind glass, this uh, big open trading room and, uh, uh, where a lot of portfolio managers are working. Uh, somebody walks up and says, oh, you guys trying to get in? And uh, we said, well, yeah. And they said, well, come on. And they lead us in. And so we stand in the back um, and uh, we're watching these guys work. And we just, um, snap a few pictures. No one seems bugged by that. Uh, the, the, this guy turns and says, what are you guys doing here? And we said, well, we're working on the new portfolio management system, and we want to see how you guys work. And he says, come on over here. Let me show you uh, how this works, because this is really complicated. And he sits with us, and he explains things. Other portfolio managers come. They, they talk to us. And we learn an awful lot in just a, a morning of watching these work and sitting alongside them. And in the end, he says, wow, this is really great. No one ever comes down here. Um, <laughs> and we show the pictures back to the organization. They say, wow, this is really great. Why doesn't anybody ever do this? It, uh, uh, these are a different kind of portfolio manager working at the same organization. And they work in teams of four. Uh, one of the uh, items on the backlog, because they work in teams, was a way for them to chat with each other uh, using chat windows and things like that. But when you watch these guys work, they've arranged their desks so they could actually chat really chat. Uh, they talk to each other all day long, and that feature seems pretty stupid once you uh, get it in a context. And uh, this particular morning, uh, the only things to note here is that if you look at this window, it's, it's, the window out there is really dark because I got up at 4 freaking AM in the morning to get to their office in San Francisco because they need to be up and run lots of algorithms uh, to figure out their trading strategy before the market opens in the US. So look, to watch people work, you've got to be there when they're working. And it's not always during business hours, or at least during my business hours. And on this particular day, uh, the, the trading algorithms had failed. And if we asked them how their process goes, and in fact we had, not once did they mention, some days the trading algorithm blows, and we spend a lot of time trying to diagnose what went wrong and figure out a manual trading strategy. It's being there that lets you see things like this show up. I've got lots of pictures like this, and in, uh, including look, last year working with teams at Kodak. I, I, Kodak asked me to come out to Mumbai to work with some teams. And I immediately thought, oh my gosh, they've, they've outsourced this work, and I can't make points to them about understanding and talking with their computers if we're dealing with outsourced development. And happily for Kodak, that wasn't the case at all. The guy on the right is a product manager, and the guy on the left uh, uh, designs printers. And we're at the Taj Hotel in Mumbai. And we're talking with that guy in the middle. He's not a software developer. He takes pictures of people for the 30 rupees. He will take your picture or your family's picture, and then he prints it out. And we spend the day in front of that hotel and at the, uh, the monument that's kind of out in the water out there. We wor watch these guys work. And at the end of the day, look, these guys are rock stars. Uh, no one ever comes out and visits them. And, and these guys walk away with this strong understanding for what it's like to be a user of, well, the printer they're trying to design a better version of. This guy is a person named Atik. He works at a US company called Edmunds.com. Edmunds is an automotive website. Uh, it's where I'd go to get compare car information and service records on used cars and uh, other information on new cars. And they, they help car buyers. But look, they've long since stopped talking with their user, at least users, at least back when I started working with them. And one of our first things that we did was to pull in a lot of people for them to talk to. 
the person sitting across from Atik is not a developer. She bought a car recently, and he's uh, talking with her. It, it turns out Atik runs the analytics group inside of Edmonds. And at the end of the day, at our reflection, look, he said, look, I've always been confident I can tell you precisely what users do on our site. But it's not until today that I realized that I could never tell you why. It's looking people in the face and asking them more questions that you can figure out why they do what they do. It unravels a lot of puzzles. A lesson learned for me is data is an empathy, and it takes the pairing of those two things to really make useful decisions. And this is why you hear so often in agile development that if you're going to do this well, you need a good product owner. They're the ones who will do this, they'll figure this stuff out, and then they will tell you what the right thing to do is. And I thought, as a product owner, that's, that's what I'd need to do. And I could go out and figure this stuff out and tell people what they should build. But, well, it doesn't actually work that way either. This is a model I'll often draw to talk about where the sweet spot is, the kind of product we're looking for. This model comes from a guy named Marty Kagan. Uh, Marty Kagan's, uh, among other things, uh, he, he started at eBay as a third product manager when eBay was a startup or was a very small company. And when he left eBay in the late 2000s, was in charge of 60 product managers and all of user experience and led product there. If you were a product manager at eBay, he would tell you your job is to find a product that is this intersection of what's valuable, valuable to, your organ to us, to eBay, to our organization, valuable to customers and users, usable by them, and feasible to build in the time and tools we've got. Look, any idiot can come up with fabulous feature ideas that people can't figure out how to use. So, well, they need to work with people that can figure out how to make them usable. And look, uh, the, any idiot can come up with feature ideas that are way too expensive to build, given the time and tools we've got. Look, if you ask me uh, my ideal car or home, I promise you I can come up with lots of things I can't afford. Challenge is finding that sweet spot, the thing that we can afford. And as a consequence, if you are a good product manager doing this stuff well, you focus primarily on value, but you find people that understand users and understand how to talk with them and work with them. And that ends up being user experience people or in some organizations that aren't building commercial products, business analysts fill that role. And you want people, you want to work closely with someone who's an engineer, someone who spots feasibility concerns or constraints soon, someone that can tell you that's going to be expensive, that, but that's a, that's a great idea, that will be cost effective to build. It's this core team or balance team or, look, if I walk into companies like, I'll walk into companies like Atlassian, uh, uh, who make Jira and Confluence, and when I walk in, they'll, they'll point to me an area where a team works and they'll say, this is where the triad sits. The triad is this team of three. I'll walk into a couple months ago was with Spotify. They refer to this group as the trio. And it's this group of three. Well, it sort of busts up that scrum single product owner thing. And yeah, there is a person who's primarily responsible. But if they're working on this stuff alone, if they're building backlogs alone, if they're doing this work alone, it just does not work. This is this Marty Kagan guy. Let's see if my sound works here. This is a, there's a lot of short little video clips on YouTube where he's describing a lot of these concepts, but he describes one of the, well, the secrets to why this is kind of valuable. Now, even though officially the product owner is responsible for functionality and the designer on usability and the engineer on feasibility, the little secret in software teams is that um, truth is usually the best innovations actually come from the lead developer. Uh, and the reason for that is that the lead developer typically knows what's possible better than anyone else. So while officially you all have those responsibility, really what's going on is all three of you are trying to identify that minimum viable product. Uh, one last point in terms of uh, location. It's at all humanly possible you want to keep those three co-located right in the same location. So, easy to find video on YouTube. Uh, for him, but look, the lessons learned are, the, uh, for years, throughout the 2000s, I kept running into product teams, I kept running into scrum teams that, well, the, that were really effective, that seemed like they were really doing well, and I'll ask them, well, how's this scrum thing going? And they say, well, we're doing scrum, but we're probably not doing it right, because the product owner really works closely with a lot of, 
lot of other people, and he doesn't write all the stories himself. himself. In fact, he works closely with other people, and, and they figure it out together. And we know it's not scrum right, and we're trying to do it right, but uh, it works too well doing it this other way. Look, it's over time that I learned that Product owners lead a cross-functional team, and they don't just work alone either. They bring the whole team in. They help them take ownership, and everyone takes ownership. They all become responsible for inventing and innovating. So, uh, look, I, uh, moving forward, I would say, look, if fine. We'll figure this out now. If we get the right people, and we really work to, work to understand our users, and we work together, we'll get this right. We'll build software that uh, achieves strong outcomes. Uh, uh, we'll be successful. And look, in talking with Marty, uh, just nonchalantly, as we were driving somewhere and working together with a client, he said, well, if you're really good at this stuff, you'll be right about a third of the time. Now, I kind of freaked out, because when he says you'll be right about a third of the time, I think I'm wrong two-thirds of the time. And he says, yeah, that's kind of the way it works. So th this stuff is, is hard. You don't get it right. And, and that's if you're good. Most people write maybe only, if you're pretty good, 20% of the time. And everybody's right sometimes. But, uh, and I said, well, give me a quote I can use. I said, uh, it's usually 50 to 80% of all the software we ship fails to accomplish its objectives. What he means by that is, it doesn't mean that the feature didn't go into the product. It doesn't mean that everybody hated it. It means that, well, for a lot of what we build, it just, not much happens. People might use it a little bit. Uh, they don't think the feature's uh, great or uh, fabulous. They just think, ah, it's OK. Uh, and what do you do? You don't pull it out. But it sure did not deliver the business value or the benefit you expected. Now, for years in software development, especially in agile development, I've been seeing people cite this, well, this Standish Group report, the Chaos Report, and it delivers these haunting facts that after surveying lots of projects that most of the features we build fall into this category of rarely or never used. And a lot of people in, in an Agile context I've seen uh, say, look, an Agile process will solve this. But look, it doesn't. Uh, I've been through this a long time. I'm able to fool myself into believing those features will be used. And I'm pretty confident that all those other projects that failed, everybody who put those features in didn't think they would be rarely or never used. A lot of features fall into the category of they really seem like a good idea at the time. Anybody old enough to remember Clippy? Um, Look, uh, you can take an opportunity. We know that all products aren't equal. If I can think of a, a product to uh, build a, a portable music player, and a long time ago, in the late 2000s, uh, people did. And look, Apple builds something that's great. And Microsoft says, look, th there's a real demand for a product like this. We can build something that's great. And there's a lot of people that really believe that Microsoft Zune was going to be a great product. Uh, this guy believed it well enough that uh, he put a tattoo on his arm. Uh, but look, the product did not do so well. It was dismal. It was losing a lot of money. And uh, uh, some people are super convinced this product would uh, do well. So uh, that's a level of commitment you don't see for most product people. Now, I mentioned Atik and Edmunds.com. This is Eugene. He's, a, he's the director of product management at Edmunds. And I, I'd heard Marty say that you're, you're right only a third of the time. And I went back. Uh, look, I've been working with Edmunds.com for a long time. They've been using this kind of approach for a while. And they've been getting good at measuring outcomes, getting good at figuring out whether the things they build work or don't work. And I asked him, look, is what Marty's saying true? Uh, are, you, are we right? Are you right so little? And he said, yeah, yeah, it'd be great if we were right a third of the times. We're right about two in 10 times. Now, you can tell he's not a developer. Otherwise, he would have reduced that fraction to one in five. But, uh, but uh, what he said we've done over time is we've built a more flexible architecture. It's become, because we're wrong so often, uh, and we have to pull, put things in and pull things out, we have to very quickly measure whether they're good or bad. A, a side effect of focusing on this stuff is being really good at uh, reversing our decisions, really good at validating things are good. So, 
look, the, the lesson learned here is what we're doing is hard. We're usually wrong. And instead of planning to maximize velocity, uh, we need to make better plans uh, to learn. This is another team at a US company called Snag a Job. You wouldn't have uh, heard of them, but uh, their focus, their target market are for hourly em employees that are hourly wage employees. You know, one of, the, one of their bigger customers is Burger King in the US, so they hi help hire tens of thousands of Burger King employees and employees of, at Walmart and at other uh, big retailers and fast food restaurants, things like that. This is a team at a daily stand up and they're uh, a little depressed. And when you look at their board, it's got the traditional columns of the, the stuff we want to build, and uh, they have some stops for uh, doing some um, further analysis or what would be a backlog grooming kind of thing. And uh, everything moves across the board until a last step where it's ready for release, but things do not come off the board when they're ready for release. They tag things with those pink stickies to say it's been released, and because they're a dot com, they can release, they can measure fairly quickly. Uh, they leave things on the board, and next to it are specific kind of uh, things they're trying to influence. Uh, RPV uh, is revenue per visit, and they're trying to, well, they're watching revenue per visit, they're hoping it goes up, but in fact, right now, as a consequence of that feature, it's starting to go down. Uh, next to it on the card are specific smaller metrics that tell whether people are using the feature they're putting in. They've got this explicit measurement step, and every day at their daily stand-up meetings, they talk about not just what we're doing yesterday, what we're doing today, but what we shipped, and is it working or not? And nothing leaves that board until they have a discussion about what they've learned. This is an, an agile team that's not focused on output. This is an agile team that's focused on outcome. And uh, one of the annoying things is, well, what they're learning is, crap, this stuff fails a lot. We put stuff in, we ship it fast, it's high quality, and nothing happens. Things don't go up. Our, our bets, our gambles, we're all wrong. Uh, this is the guy that leads engineering right now, Thomas uh, Friedel. Um, they were working on, this is a very disappointing story. This is a team working on a, a major site uh, revamp and everything they keep doing isn't working. The, the site redesign they're working with is failing and uh, they chewed on this forever. Look, in theory, the project was done months ago, but it's failing from an outcome perspective, so they keep uh, pushing things into it to try and influence and like talking with him, he says, yeah, we, we eventually scrapped that. Uh, we killed it. We found that after spending all that time and all that money, it wasn't going to work. But what really came out of that was a strong architecture that helped us release quicker and learn faster. So look, I might have had the assumption going into this that great architecture is all about scalability and performance. And what I'm learning that that's not typically it. This is uh, Thomas uh, again. It's, uh, every organization I work with that's doing well has uh, a re-architecting, re-platforming project going on. Nobody ever seemed to plan on the growth that they've got. Um, they all have fun naming conventions. The, they had an original architecture, which is a little messy, and somebody had a great idea for a better architecture, and they called this new project to re-architect Eagle. Um, uh, Eagle trundled along and then started to fail, and they came up with a, another architecture strategy uh, called Phoenix. Uh, you know what a phoenix is? It's a bird that uh, uh, is reborn in flames. Uh, uh, so oh, great. So uh, e uh, Phoenix will replace Eagle, and now they've got the old architecture plus some parts of Eagle and some parts of Phoenix on top of that. And then Phoenix is going sideways. That's not working. Uh, and so they come up with uh, another architecture that they call Tucson. Now, if you look at a map of Arizona, uh, uh, Tucson is to the right of uh, Phoenix, and it's uh, kind of going sideways from that. Uh, and uh, Tucson, uh, well, eventually failed, but out of this whole focus on quickly releasing and testing, they come up, came up with, I'm glad they got a new uh, paradigm, but their new architecture is called Somersault. And somersault is uh, quickly displacing things because they have a real need for it. You know, they always had pretty good scalability and performance, but boy, it's focusing on the need to learn faster that made a difference. 
This is a guy named Bill Scott. Anybody ever heard of Bill Scott before? Any engineers have heard of him? Look, uh, so a couple hands here. Uh, Bill is, uh, uh, goes way back for, uh, in a lot of areas, but uh, built a lot of fame inside, working inside of Netflix. And Netflix is fabulous at uh, building and measuring how well things work. And just recently started with, uh, recently now a couple of years, started with uh, PayPal. And he's, PayPal has got some really horrendous architecture. And he makes the point that, look, engineers traditionally start by focusing on scalability and performance and, and reuse of all their components. And look, we spend a lot of time investing in designing reusable stuff when we haven't even proved yet that anybody wants to use it in the first place. Uh, architect first for use before reuse. And he makes strong points about architecting, building architects that allow, make it really fast for us to prototype and validate things. He's got a book coming out on lean architecture. Let's go uh, full back. Uh, this is, uh, I find that uh, this is Eugene again at Edmonds. And when I talk to him about how this journey has changed him, he said, well, we used to have a content management system that uh, did A-B testing. We used a product called Test and Target to do a lot of this. But we found that, yeah, that was too big too clumsy, too bumpy to do this. And we found that uh, we started rolling our own ways to test or measure. And over time, we just weren't using test and target anymore. Uh, I hear the, you know, a, a notable poster child for architecting their own ways of measuring are companies like Etsy. And there's, if you're an engineer, look at Etsy's engineering blogs to look at how they release quickly and do one button releases and testing. I see the same story that organizations that really focus on learning fast, different architecture comes out of it. The lesson learned for me is engineer first for experimentation, then focus on scalability and performance. Prove that people want to use it before you focus on the reusability. So look, all right, we can't ever be right, and we can start to architect to, to build things faster. So look, all we need to do is build, measure, and learn, and we can, we can use this lean startup mantra where our focus isn't on velocity, our focus in lean startup is on learning velocity, how fast we learn. There's no story points in lean startup. In fact, that's one of the challenges that makes it hard to explain is how do you measure how much you've got done? If in a lean startup situation you try 20 experiments and they all fail, that's good. You learned, uh, you invalidated 20 bad ideas that you shouldn't have built to begin with. You've minimized output. Uh, put a couple stories in here. A guy that works with Bill Scott at PayPal is Cody. And Cody told me a long, involved story about PayPal working with a feature to allow you to do Facebook sign-on for PayPal. Now, does, uh, people here, everybody's used PayPal, right? Does everybody use that Facebook sign-in feature for PayPal? No, because there isn't one. It was a stupid idea, it turns out. Look, uh, they built the whole thing. They built it in prototypes. They tested it in labs. They had people come in, and they proved that people could easily use it. And people said, look, we'll, uh, we, really, we really like this uh, feature. They built it. They launched it in a limited area. And uh, what they found out is, uh, look, yeah, people could use it. But suddenly, when they were actually paying for stuff with their own credit card, the last thing they wanted Facebook to know was anything about their credit cards or financial situation. And uh, they were horrified by the idea of signing in with Facebook. So after spending many months and building lots of stuff, they realized uh, this is a stupid feature. Uh, we should have done something else to really validate that people would use this before we overinvested in it. This is a guy named Bill Buxton, and he's, uh, he's notable in the user experience community. Uh, he has an expression that I like, that the, well, the difference, when you look at prototypes, the difference between high fidelity and low fidelity is stupid. There's only right fidelity and wrong fidelity. And the right fidelity is the fidelity we need to build to learn what we need to use. Now, I'll advocate building very simple paper prototypes or other things that really look real. But at some point in time, uh, you need to transcend to things that really work like they're real. It, with things that look real, you can put them in front of users. They can step through them. And you can see if they're usable. You can see if they like them. And you can ask users, would you use this? And Cody at PayPal did that. Uh, but what we really need to get good at measuring is, did they use it? 
that's what things like A-B testing are for, and that's what other types of experimentation are for. And more and more, I'm seeing organizations that figure out how to build and release skeletal features that just barely work, that absolutely do not scale, that store data in weird ways just to get by, just to ch test with a subset of users. It's, uh, it's moving to really validating if our stuff really does work. To experiment effectively starts taking time and money, and it takes the whole organization's participation to get behind it. Well, let me tell one last story, and let's see how, if I can pull this together. And I like this story. This is about Edmunds.com. Edmunds launched a feature called Price Promise. And it turns out, and I'm sure it's true here, that one of the things that people really hate about buying cars is negotiating with car salesmen, or negotiating a full stop. I realize I'm in India, and I'm looking at Naresh, and I've seen him negotiate. Uh, and it doesn't seem like he hates it, uh, but I hate it. Uh, and so they launched this feature called Price Promise, where you can get a lowest price online, and you get the promise from the dealership that you walk in, you pay exactly that price, they will not upsell you on anything, you pay that price, and you, leave, you uh, give them the money, you shake hands, and you leave. That's it. They've got this idea, and you can ask consumers, do you like it? And they say, I'd love that. They can ask dealers, would you give us pricing, uh, lowest rock bottom prices that we can publish online for your cars? They say, well, yeah, yeah, we would, especially if people came in and bought it. And they had asked people, would you? But for them to measure, could you, they were serious about measuring. They got. Uh, they made partnerships with dealers in the Portland, Oregon area of the US. Uh, they had dealers send prices to them in spreadsheets. They manually inserted pricing and information uh, using SQL statements into their back-end database. They built just enough of the feature so that it would work in this Portland, Oregon area. And they ran for a few months actually seeing if people would use the feature, actually buy things. And you know, when I talked to Eugene, he says, look, in the past, we would have argued and argued for months about this. And then we would have either gone all in and spent millions building this feature, or we would have said, no, we're not going to do it. Now, after getting good at this, we're willing to pay to learn. We'll spend a few hundred thousand dollars and a few months of development time and, and learn. It's a pithy expression that a friend of mine, David Hussman, uses that the difference between learning and failure is how much money you spend to do it. Uh, look, I can spend a few days of time and th chuck it and say that was learning, but it's hard to spend months of team time and pretend that was learning. Um, it's, uh, that, that looks like failure. What I see with organizations is them gradually moving that bar up. When it comes to prototypes, we progressively scale fidelity. We focus on how fast we learn, not how fast we build. And in the end, I keep hoping that I'm really going to find a process that works. Uh, and when I go back and ask, well, I've used a couple examples here, is, look, uh, Eugene says, that we have the misperception that the process we follow, the, the methods, would produce success. And yeah, sometimes, but most of the time it isn't. We've got to just pay attention. And, uh, and what Thomas uh, says is, look, we're looking for a process that helps us not fool ourselves. So that's where I'm going to end here. I'm finding that uh, from the beginning, I've built a career around thinking I'm good at development, thinking I'm good at UI design, thinking I'm good at making product decisions. And it's been 20 plus years later that I'm starting to realize that that's a stupid strategy. That as an uh, organizationally, we're finally evolving to processes that help us learn faster, that help us not fool ourselves. And it is 10 o'clock and 29 minutes, and I've left no time for questions or even time for uh, Naresh to wrap up much. So <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Do we have time for a couple questions? Sure. Man, you're, you're in charge. <laughs> Wait, what? Does that leave anybody anything they can ask a question about? You want to talk about books? Yeah. And I want to thank people, and we want to shut it down. Thanks a lot, Jeff. This is fantastic. Thank
Thank you very much for listening to all this. So. interested in getting a personal autograph book from Jeff, uh, you just go out there. Uh, you will have a counter over there. They're, they have about 20 copies of these books, so you can buy these books at a uh, much cheaper price than what you would get in the U.S. Uh, or what price Jeff would get at. Uh, list price in the U.S., and it's still a lot more than I'd pay uh, to buy them here in India. So uh -huh. <laughs> anyway. It's a good opportunity to get a personal autograph book from Jeff. Thank you, Jim. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks.